Mark chapter 8, verses 27 to 30. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked. Who do you say that I am? Peter answered, You are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Just to think back today, um, we've been in the book of Mark quite a bit recently, and we've touched on a few different stories from closer to the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And one of those was when Jesus first called his disciples. So if you think back, um, what did Jesus say when he was calling his disciples in the beginning? What, what invitation did he give them? Follow me. Follow me, yes. He said, come follow me. That was how he kind of started that relationship off. And um, the cool thing about that invite is that by reading through the Gospels, as we've been doing, as we get to do um, such easy access to Bibles in our day, um, is that we get to follow Jesus alongside them. And so as they're following Jesus and we're reading the stories, um, we get to experience the things and hear the things. <laughs> okay, switch. Uh, right alongside. about that, guys. Um, so, as they are hearing Jesus' sermons and hearing Jesus' parables, we get to hear those sermons and parables. And as they're watching Jesus heal people, we get to watch him heal those people. And as they're um, seeing these other miracles, the um, feeding of the 5,000 and those kinds of things, we get to experience those. Um, John, in his gospel often refers to the miracles of Jesus as signs and wonders because um, while miraculous, he sees them as um, fulfilling the purpose of being a sign of who Jesus is. And so we get to see those signs through the disciples' eyes as we're reading through the gospels while they follow Jesus. Um, we get to witness alongside as they follow his love and compassion for the crowds as he uh, repeatedly is um, interacting with love with those who would normally be marginalized or ignored. He welcomes the children to him, and he talks to the women, and he doesn't turn away uh, Roman soldiers or Samaritans. We get to be there to see that as they follow and see it. Um, so as they follow, and they watch, and they listen, they get to know Jesus more and more, and they start to understand who he is better and better than they did that day when he walked up on the side of the lake and said, hey, follow me. I mean, at that point, um, they didn't have as deep of an understanding until finally it reaches the point in the story um, that we had for our scripture reading right before I started here, um, where Peter's asked the question, who do you say I am? And he's been following all this time, and he's been seeing all this stuff and hearing all these lessons, and he finally reaches the conclusion, you are the Messiah. Now, what is a Messiah? That's not a word we use, like, real frequently nowadays outside of church. What is a Messiah? What role does a Messiah play? Savior. A Messiah is someone that is going to save a group of people. Excellent. And so um, there are certain expectations that we all have for a Savior, right? We think of someone strong and powerful and mighty, um, someone that's triumphant, someone that's going to beat the bad guys. And the Jews, the disciples, um, the people in that time would have had similar expectations as well. A Savior, a Messiah is going to be someone powerful and mighty. Um, and they not only um, 
have those general characteristics, but had the idea that it would be someone that could show up and help to free the Jewish people from the Romans who had occupied their area and were overseeing them. Um, they envisioned someone like King David in the past that could be a great warrior king leader for them. So um, they had this very specific picture in their minds of what this Messiah was like, and they had been promised a long, long time ago that the Messiah would come. So it had to be a very exciting moment for Peter to come to the realization that he is with the Messiah right now. They've been waiting and waiting um, in the Advent season. We sometimes sing the song, Come the Long Expected Jesus, because uh, this is something that as a people, it had been quite a while that they've known a Messiah's coming, they've been waiting, and so finally Peter reaches this realization as he's been following, this is it, Jesus is this Messiah that I want. So exciting acknowledgement from Peter, and then Jesus responds in a really interesting way. And that is that he starts to bluntly and explicitly tell them, I'm going to die soon. Now, anyone who thinks they have just found their savior, <laughs> the one who's going to save everyone, um, that's not what they expected to hear. And he elaborates and he says, not only am I going to die, there's going to be suffering involved. He starts to talk about the way of the cross. And, and so Peter and the rest of the disciples are hearing this and it just does not make sense with what you think a Messiah should be doing, right? It doesn't, is he the Messiah? Is he going to die? How can those both be true? Um, so Peter actually goes so far as to say, whoa, that's not right. And Jesus has to rebuke him and say, stop, that is the plan. So there's a lot of doubt and uncertainty and fear of like, we thought we had it figured out. We thought we knew that you're the Messiah, but now you're saying you're going to die and it's going to be painful and bad, and it's coming up soon. So um, in their minds, I'm sure they were saying, make it make sense. <laughs> I, I, I've come to this conclusion that I was so sure about, and now you're telling me something that doesn't fit with the pieces. And that is where um, our story comes in today. And we're going to stay in Mark. We've been in Mark, and we're going to be there again today. But um, one of the interesting things about this is that our story for today is in all three of the synoptic gospels, and um, it has the same two sections about Peter declaring that Jesus is the Messiah and about Jesus predicting his death immediately before that. Now, within the gospels, even the ones that have the same stories, there's a lot of um, shifting in the order. So you can see in their minds, was it a huge deal for them if he healed a blind man first or a lame man? And so some of those come a little bit kind of mixed up as you're reading the different accounts. But in all of the minds of the people writing these Gospels, it was very important that Peter recognized he was the Messiah, and then he told them that he was going to die soon, and then we come to today. So there's something about um, these two accounts building towards our story that was really significant in all of their minds. And I believe the reason is that understanding our story today is what allows them to reconcile those two seemingly disparate, disconnected facts to be true. So how can Jesus be the Messiah and still die soon, um, knowingly, willingly? How do those things both make sense? And so um, that's what we come to today. And we come to it annually because today is a holiday, and we've talked about Valentine's Day a few times, but that's not the one I mean. Who knows what holiday today is? It's Transfiguration Sunday. So um, we're going to read about the Transfiguration, which, as I said, in all three Synoptic Gospels comes right after uh, the stories that we just talked about. And... Um, as we look at it, it can help us to understand how can these two opposite seeming things both be true. So if you'll turn with me to Mark 9, we're going to start at verse 2. <clears throat> Mark 9, the transfiguration. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him, 
and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice from the cloud came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, they looked around. When they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. This is the word of the Lord. All right, so um, this is a pretty extraordinary event. Some of our um, Bible stories are... Um, pretty commonplace sounding stories where people are just having a chat. This is not one of those. Um, this is one of those big, amazing events. And um, it helps to show that despite his unexpected, radical plan, which could cause some to question if he could actually be this long foretold Messiah, um, he is deeply connected to Jewish history and to the fulfillment of the law and the prophets and to the coming Messiah. So Moses and Elijah show up with Jesus, and that probably makes us question, why would those two show up? What was going on with that? Um, seems kind of odd. So today we're going to talk about two reasons why they're there. Um, and the first that I want us to think about is the presence of Elijah. So um, Elijah had been prophesied to be a forerunner of the Messiah. So John the Baptist had been figuratively filling the role of Elijah as the one who was preparing the way for the Lord. And um, if you think back in that passage from the scripture reading, when Jesus had asked, who do people say I am? Remember, one of the guesses was Elijah, because some people thought rather than the Messiah that he's the one preparing the way for the Messiah. So they had already started to make this connection in their minds of, you know, is he the Messiah? Is he preparing the way for the Messiah? Because they knew in their history that Elijah was a forerunner and he would prepare the way. And um, in the Matthew version, uh, Jesus tells them that, yes, John the Baptist has been filling that Elijah role for us. But not only has he had John the Baptist figuratively filling the forerunner role of Elijah, Elijah now has literally shown up with the Messiah here on this mountain. And so for these disciples who are Jewish to see this, and for anyone that they tell afterwards, that would be a pretty clear, large sign that this is that promised Messiah. Because the forerunner has now appeared on a mountain with him. Now... Um, I'm sure that with John the Baptist there, having already fulfilled that role and having already figured out that Jesus is the Messiah, they probably thought that like that was the end of it. Like, okay, John the Baptist has kind of been the Elijah for Jesus. So imagine how amazing that would be for Peter, James, and John to look up and actually see this figure from their history who is such an important person um, they're conversing with Jesus in front of them. So that was a pretty amazing, exciting moment and um, very reaffirming of that statement and that belief that Jesus is this promised Messiah. So Peter, while he may have had some doubts when Jesus revealed his plan, is now vindicated in his belief because clearly here he is filling off those prophecy check marks of things that would happen for him to be the Messiah, that the forerunner is literally showing up here with Jesus on the mountain. So that's a pretty exciting thing for Elijah to be here with them. And then um, the second is we've got Moses and Elijah together. And likely that represents with Moses the law and with Elijah the prophets. Moses is the one that the Lord gave the Ten Commandments, and he brought them down and gave them to the people. Um, 
There were a number of prophets, and that represented kind of another era of their history, so Elijah would have represented that. And that kind of shows that um, when Jesus shows up, this isn't an out-of-the-blue thing. He's not just preaching some disconnected new message, but he is fulfilling all that was started with the law and the prophets. God is continuing his work that was already begun all those years ago, and Jesus is now coming and fulfilling all that has come before him. So as Moses and Elijah are there with Jesus having this conversation, um, they start to see how Jesus as the Messiah is able to come and fulfill all that they have been um, studying and believing and waiting up for and that um, as he's here now, things are going to be able to be different in the future because the law and the prophets are being fulfilled before their very eyes. So um, their presence here on this mountain is a very exciting reaffirmation of the fact that Jesus is indeed the Messiah. Peter was not off track in that conclusion and that bold statement that he made um, just one chapter before. So one of those two facts is now affirmed. Um, the second thing that I want to think about, besides reaffirming that he's the Messiah, as they had concluded, he is revealed as the Son of God on this mountain. <laughs> um, and there's kind of two ways that that really is shown. Um, we have here the embodiment of God's glory and power in Jesus Christ on this mountain. And because of that, he's able to save us in a way that no normal person could. And so um, he can save us from something way bigger than an army of people, than an occupying um, foreign ruler, than anything like that that they may have been expecting or hoping for. By being the son of God, he's able to save them from an even bigger oppressor. And he demonstrates that, once again, in two ways that I want to think about. The first is the atmosphere of this scene in general. So they're up on a mountaintop. Which historically, if you're going through the Old Testament, um, there's a lot of exciting moments where people get to meet God on mountaintops. And um, we kind of have an expression within church culture of a mountaintop experience. So if people go to a camp or a conference or something and it's really good, um, they'll say they had a mountaintop experience. And that means when you kind of meet with God, and that's based on all these instances in the Bible where people go up a mountain and then God shows up. And... Um, Often, as with this story, there's a cloud there that symbolizes God's presence with the people. So they're up on this mountain, the cloud is there, and then the voice comes. Um, we're told that his garment is so white that no bleach could possibly make it that white. Uh, the Matthew version says that his face was more radiant than the sun. So this would have been quite the startling um, awe-inspiring scene and in this take it said they were so they didn't even know what to say <laughs> they're so frightened and amazed by what's happening um, so clearly uh, if I want to impress people I can't make myself radiant like the Sun and I can't turn my clothes whiter than bleach I can't have a voice speak from a cloud these are things that helps to demonstrate that Jesus is the Son of God it's not something that a normal person could do um, to show that they should have you know, respect or authority or popularity. Um, this is God stepping in in a big, powerful way. Besides the general atmosphere that is going on, we actually have God's words about Jesus, where he says, echoing the words from the baptism, this is my son. Now, a year ago on Transfiguration Sunday, we spent more time focused on the words. Um, so if you remember back that far, you can think about it or come back in a few years and maybe the emphasis will be kind of on that again. But God is establishing that Jesus is his son. Jesus is God. Come here to be with the people, um, not just a person. So as amazing as this scene is to us and as big of a revelation is, it is, is still not the end of the story. And one of the things that I find really interesting about it is that at this point, the disciples can say, okay, Jesus is the Messiah, that is now clear. Jesus is the Son of God, we've seen all that that happens. But this implication of what it would really mean when, for when he dies um, is something that will really only 
make more sense and be more comprehensible to them in the future once they've had the death and the resurrection and then they can look back and put all the pieces together. And so um, as they're following, they are getting more pieces and more evidence and greater understanding, but there's still more to come and to add to the experiences that they've had now. Um, so this gives them some context for the death, but they still don't fully understand until after the Spirit comes when Jesus is resurrected and they're waiting. And then they can look back at this and say, oh, that's what this meant. Um, when Jesus dies on the cross, because he is sinless son of God here on our behalf, he is able to be that atoning sacrifice to save us from sin and death itself instead of just a person that you know made a big sacrifice that could maybe be inspirational to others. There are some movies where a leader of a movement will be killed and then their martyrdom inspires others to fight harder or something. That's the way that a normal savior could potentially make a difference with their death. But because Jesus is not just a person, but the son of God, with his death, he actually tears the veil, removes our sin if we're willing to accept his forgiveness and is able to save us from death itself. And so when we combine the revelation that they receive here at the transfiguration with the events that come after um, his time on the cross, his resurrection, then we start to see really how significant that is that he was willing to go through all that. So we're entering Lent this week. Um, and that leads us up to, culminates with Holy Week and the cross. And so as we're thinking about Jesus suffering and death in the coming days, I want us to really be thinking about what a difference it makes that he's not just a Messiah, but that he's the Son of God here filling that role for us. Um, that God himself stepped in because it's that detail that truly confirmed on this holiday um, is what is able to provide that, that saving um, power for us to be free from sin and death. That no um, dedicated, faithful person, Savior, would ever be able to do to us. So we really, as we're going through Lent and thinking about his suffering and his death, um, think about what a big implication it is that the Son of God was willing to come and do that on our behalf and for us. I have two things as a result of this Transfiguration Sunday that I want you to kind of think about. Um, the first is kind of what I just talked about. Let's remember to praise and honor God um, and Jesus for how glorious he is. We, I think, spend a lot of time focused on how accessible and humble he is. We think about the stories when he's with the kids and he's helping out the sick. But let's not forget that alongside of that is also this story and others similar where um, Jesus is God and the glory of God um, can't be, can, we talked about heaven can't contain the glory of the sun. Um, this is something too that we want to remember to always be praising and honoring Jesus for his majesty and his glory as well as his um, humility and his accessibility. So let's keep that in mind as we think about Jesus today. And the second is um, that idea about the disciples following. So when Jesus had said, come follow me, uh, they recognized him as a rabbi. And then as they are learning from him and following him and watching, Peter starts to realize, oh, he's the Messiah. And then as they come to the transfiguration and things continue to go on, they come to the realization, oh, he's the son of God. And so their understanding continued to grow as they followed. And as more um, snapshots and pieces of the story fell into place, they could put them together and understand better. And the same is true for us. So if you're ever feeling a moment where things aren't really making sense, or you're not fully understanding something, um, Remember, that was true of the disciples, too. They did not understand how could he be the Messiah and be planning to die. That doesn't really fit. But they continued to faithfully follow anyways. They didn't say, oh, well, must have been wrong. I'm expecting a Messiah that will win battles and then just leave him at that point. They would have missed out on the transfiguration. They would have missed out on the death and resurrection. But even though it didn't make sense to them at the time, they stayed and continued to follow and continued to question him. Um, so 
for you as well as we're following on this journey. If there are points when you're going along the way and you're not fully understanding, just remember that there are miles ahead and there are experiences ahead and there are mountaintops ahead. And as those come along, um, they all start to fit together and to give you a greater understanding as we go along. And one of the things I think that's exciting about this story too is that it reminds us of one of the pictures that's still ahead for us. So in this story, the disciples are given a glimpse of the glory of God and Jesus Christ as he's up on this mountain. He's transfigured, he's radiant, he's glowing, they're seeing God's glory. And then he kind of goes back to normal for their appearance and goes through stuff. But we're reminded that one day Jesus will come back in all his glory and everyone is going to bow down and acknowledge him. And that's one that we still get to look forward to. So one day we are going to get to be there and just like the disciples hearing that he's going to die, but not really understanding all the details and mechanics of that. We know he's coming back, but we don't have the exact timeline. We haven't gotten the exact image right in our minds. There's a whole lot of parables that give us some general concepts about it, but none of us can probably claim to have the exact play-by-play um, -play of that moment. We for sure don't know when it is. But we have the promise that it's coming. And so as we continue to follow, we can at least look forward to that moment still to come in our stories. So um, remember to continue following even as things are making sense and be willing to um, look back and look forward and combine all those pieces as you seek a greater understanding of Jesus. So let's end with a word of prayer. Lord, um, the story of your transfiguration is one that is... Um, filled with fantastic images uh, that are out of the norm when we picture you radiant and shining, whiter than um, anything could naturally make things, Lord. And um, we picture a voice in the clouds. It's all um, just awe-inspiring. And so we want to praise you and lift you up and glorify your name, Lord. Um, and we want to also praise you and thank you for being willing, despite being... Um, glorious and the son of God being willing to come here and be the savior for us offering yourself um, as a sinless sacrifice on our behalf Lord and so um, we want to thank you for being a savior that um, none of us could could be because we aren't perfect um, sinless son of God um, people Lord and so we want to thank you and praise you for that and honor you for that um, choice that you made out of love on our behalf, Lord. Uh, please help all of us as we continue to follow you. Uh, when we come to those moments when we believe two things to be true and they're not really fitting, to continue to follow and to ask questions and um, to wait for you to reveal how they can be reconciled, Lord, just like you did for the disciples in this moment on the mountain, um, showing them that you could be both the Messiah and um, have to suffer death in the future, Lord. And um, I pray that you will bless and honor everyone for continuing in their in their journeys after you. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, I have a handful of announcements today. Uh, prayer group meets this Thursday here at the church. That's at 7 o'clock, so everyone's invited to join. Uh, we had asked last week for some volunteers to be videographer. Um, I had to remind the videographer today to do it. So I just want to um, let you know a couple things. It literally involves hitting the power button, maybe doing a zoom on the top, and then hitting start. So it's not a complicated process. Um, anyone could do it. If someone that comes regularly could volunteer, that would be ideal. But if a couple people volunteer, then there could be backups or that kind of thing. Um, at this point, no one has volunteered. so. We may or may not be able to have that happen next week already and going forward. So if you're willing to give that a try or whatever, talk to um, pastor at the end so that can get worked out. Alabaster is coming up March 7th and the 14th will be the kind of backup day. Now, March 7th sounds kind of far off to me, but that's already only three weeks away. <laughs> so. Time is flying. <laughs> You've got three weeks to suddenly convert all your cash to coins, get in the box, or just bring cash. Um, but Alabaster is one of those great things that we do to support the mission of building 
physical um, churches and work ministry centers and that kind of thing all around the world so that uh, people can be reached with the great news about Jesus Christ. So that's a great opportunity that we have to reach out and help in a tangible, physical way around the world. Okay, so for three months, we're going to have once per month on a Saturday from about 10 to noon, a little Bible basics class. And um, that'll the first one will kind of be like an intro overview about the Bible. The second one will be an overview of the Old Testament. The third one will be an overview of the New Testament. So the first one will be taking place in March, probably at the end of the month. Um, but this is something for you to keep in mind for March, April, May to try to take advantage of. Uh, Jim will be facilitating that for us, so we appreciate him. And um, this is a great chance if you just have... Um, some questions about the Bible or want to refresh her about the Bible or um, want to think about how it kind of all fits together if you're usually more of a um, kind of just reading random stories and stuff it's kind of nice to put it all back together for the big picture so I encourage you if you're available to try to make it to these classes um, we have mentioned a few times happy Valentine's Day. We've got Valentine's cookies over on the side. So thank you, Marcia, for bringing those. And um, everyone can celebrate with a special sweet little treat. And a reminder that the offering is in the back as usual. So uh, may the Lord bless you and keep you and may he make his face shine upon you. We have another announcement. Chelsea needs to come down. <laughs> Rosalie and Jeff, yeah. I'm going to look at that. Um, Chelsea, on behalf of the church, the whole church, <laughs> we wanted to do a love offering. So you don't see that in there, but it's in there. <laughs> um, we are, I know I speak for everyone, we are saddened that you're going. Um, there's not a doubt about that. Um, it was a shock, <laughs> um, but of course we thank you, we thank you, we thank you for your creativity. We've seen it in this building, which will always be here. We've seen it in your um, working with kids. We've seen it with your special services. We've seen a lot. And with that, we know the time it takes to do that. Um, we know your big heart, um, just with different conversations and with support and with help, with sound equipment and all kinds of stuff um, for everybody. Um, we thank you for your words from God to us. Um, thank you. And above all, we thank you for your love. And just know that we do pray that God will lead you to whatever he wants for you and we're going to have a special prayer for you from Rosalie. Okay. You know, usually at a time like this, or for something like this, everybody would come up and um, put our hands on Chelsea, but obviously this is not the time to do that. But I would ask everybody if you would please stand as we pray for Chelsea. Dear Heavenly Father, it is with sadness our hearts are as we come to you in prayer today, we say goodbye to Pastor Chelsea, Lord, as you have called her to other things. Please be with her, guide her, give her wisdom, and give her direction in this new path that you are taking her. Father, bless her for the years that she has invested in this, your church, and all of the things that she has done for us as her church family. I pray that you will keep her, guide her, and bless her, Father. In your precious name I pray. Amen. Amen. Um, we love you. <laughs> um, I, do, I do just want to say thank you to all of you, and I love all of you as well. And definitely um, being here and having all of your love and support has helped to make me who I am today. And um, I really appreciate all of you. Thank you. <laughs>